Good morning. Good morning. Did everyone have a good Thanksgiving? Yes. Amen. God is good. Well, I got to tell you, it's good to see some friends from Jackson Hole, the Johnsons, Eric and Betty Johnson. I haven't seen them in like 30 years. Right there. Hey, wave for everyone to say. I tell you, Eric, I didn't even recognize Eric, and I'm sure he didn't recognize me. I look a lot different, uh, a lot better looking now. No, I'm just kidding. No. But, uh, is, uh, I remember, do you remember this, Eric? We used to, we used to play, and he had a river right by his house, and we used to play in a boat, and these garter snakes would chase us, and we'd get all scared and hit him with the, with the uh, oar. There you go. Thank you. And, uh, but I remember we were pretty scared about those snakes. They were pretty aggressive, but uh, we won, and the snakes lost. So anyway, <laughs> it's really cool. Good to see you guys. Anyway. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8, and the title of today's message is Jesus is the Atomic Glue, Jesus is the Atomic Glue, and hopefully that'll make sense to you, you're like, what, Jesus is the Atomic Glue, well hopefully it'll make sense, let's pray and ask God to speak to us powerfully today, Father, thank you so much for the sweet time of worship. Thank you that uh, this is a time of thanksgiving, Lord. We should always be living like it's thanksgiving, amen? Because you're so good to us, Lord. You bless us despite how we forget you at times, how we don't honor you like we should, we don't live for you. But God, you are so good. Your word says that every good gift comes from you. And so, Lord, we just thank you. And we just ask that you and your mercy, you would just speak to us right now through your holy word, that your Holy Spirit would just speak through me and that you would anoint my tongue to proclaim your truths powerfully, that it wouldn't just be words, but it would be you really convicting us, it would be you really changing us, it would be you encouraging us. Whatever need is here today, whether it be need for health, whether it be need for comfort, whether it need be for maybe encouragement, uh, whatever it is, and even conviction, we ask that you would just speak to us right now, amen? So speak, Lord, for your servants are listening, and we ask this in, in Jesus' my name. And every agreed said, Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation because I think it just says it a little clearer. Here it is. Which he, Jesus, made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence or understanding. Verse 9. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Now, here's the mystery of his will, or his mysterious plan. Notice with me, what, which was, notice what the mystery was. It's now being made known to us by, hear this, his good pleasure. And he now tells us what his mystery of his will is. And here it is, Ephesians verse 10. He says, and this is his plan. At the right time, he would bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Or as the New King James says, all things in Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. So he's going to bring all things under the authority of Christ in heaven and earth. I don't know about you, but have you noticed that our world is spinning out of control? Have you noticed that? You know, you know I, don't, I don't want to get uh, you know, too political here. But you know, well, let me, I'm jumping ahead. But how many know this? You hear people say, it's hard to be a Christian today. How many, how many hear that, right? It's hard to be a Christian. I want to tell you this. It might be hard to be a Christian at times, but how many know it's a lot harder to be a non-Christian in these days? Amen. The Bible says the way the transgressor is hard. Think about, we know that we're going to heaven if we're in Christ. We know that the Lord is coming back for us and he's going to set things right. And that gives us peace. Now, can you imagine being an atheist when all you have to look forward to is global warming? I mean, what, what, what do you have to look forward to? If you hear an atheist say it or an evolutionist, they'll say, you know what, we came from nothing and we're going to die and be nothing and that's it and it's over. And they'll say, I've heard many atheists say it's a pretty sad existence, but that's the way it is. How many are glad that that's not true? Amen. How many are glad that, that we have heaven to look forward to, that God is real? And, and hear this, I want to say this, you know, I was reading today and I, I, or last week, but uh, how many are concerned about uh, terrorism? Anyone out there? Yes. Now, how many, have, how many heard about the thing that happened in, in uh, Europe and the bombings, right? Do you remember some of those were Syrian refugees? Right. Now, do you realize that our government is going to allow 
in the next five years, more Syrian, more refugees than the population of D.C. Now, I'm not against letting people into our country. I mean, that's good. That's who we all came from somewhere. But I mean, we need to be concerned that, remember, people used to come to America because they wanted to be assimilated into America. Now people are coming to America to change America or to blow America up. How many know that's a problem? And we need to be careful with that, amen? So I don't understand that, but God bless America. But hear this. But basically, in our day and age, it says in Isaiah 5.20, it says, Woe to you in the last days. It says, Evil will be called good, and good will be called evil. And we're seeing that today, aren't we? We're seeing that the world is, that right is wrong and wrong is right. That things just don't make sense. But how many know if you're in Christ, things make sense? We might not like what's happening, but we know that God is in control and things are going to make sense. But to the rational uh, observer, things are spinning out of control. Let me give you a story about this. And this is a true story. It's an old story, but it's true. A New Jersey man and it shows how crazy our world is. He, the reporter takes us to the scene of this New Jersey man, the scene of the crime at a tomato patch, where this man allegedly bashed his victim to death with a broom and wrapped him in a newspaper and hit him. I've killed, I've killed, I admit it. But it was a rat. Do you hear that? A rat. And because of that, I'm being called a criminal, the man said. The 69-year-old gardener from New Jersey has been charged with animal cruelty. After he had taken, had killed a rat that had been eating his tomato plants, the man said that he had whacked the rat after it tried to escape from his humane trap that he set. His lawyer, lawyer said that he shouldn't be treated as a rat murderer. I didn't know there was a problem with being a rat murderer, but I guess there is. A rat murderer. The man said that he's awaiting his day in court when he can tell the world that he didn't kill the rat out of hatred or malice. My goodness. I'm a loving person, a gentle person. I don't like to hurt anybody. But the Humane Society is issuing an arrest warrant for this man to spend six months in jail and to be fined $2,500. Wow. If that doesn't tell you how weird our world's getting, you know, here, here we've got children in our schools getting gunned down. We have sexual abuse to children as an all-time high, uh, trafficking of children, of girls. Physical abuse to children is an all-time high. We're one of the highest states in the United States. But I'll tell you, something is wrong in our society when we care more about animals than we do people. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't care about animals, don't get me wrong, but how many know that we should care about people as much or more? Do you realize that our child abuse laws, do you know where they came from? They came, there was more protection to animals than there were children. And they used the animal laws in the early 1900s to protect children. How many know that's a little weird? But that's the way it was. That's how we got the protection for children so that you can't abuse your child or beat him to death. Well, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here because most of you already know what I'm saying and that these facts can lead us to great frustration and anxiety as Christians. Do I have you all depressed on Thanksgiving? There you go. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to. There's a, I'm going to turn it around, trust me. But here it is. Some sadly say, you know, with this, they say, you know what? Then to heck with it. I don't care. Let the girl, world go to hell in a handbasket. I, got, I know Jesus and I don't care. I'm just going to hide out. How many know that's not the answer? We need to care about those who don't know Jesus. We need to care about those who are confused, those who don't think like we do, and we need to speak the truth in love to them. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, how will they know unless a preacher sent? And guess what? You might not be a paid preacher. You might not be a full-time, but you're called to speak the, world, to speak the truth to the world. Amen? Amen? You're called to speak and talk to people. Some people, in dealing with their frustrations, escape in all kinds of activities. And a popular sports magazine said this, that golf is a sanctuary for a lot of people. And uh, I'm pointing to someone. I'm giving someone a hard time. People fleeing from their problems of life. And I heard a story about a man that put his golf game before everything else in the whole world. He put his golf game above everything. And one day when he was playing golf, right before he took his shot, he took off his hat and put it on his, bowed his head and put it on his chest 
as a funeral procession went by. And his friend said to him, he had played golf with him for over 20 years, he said, I've never seen you stop anything for a shot of golf. I've never seen you stop for anything. And the guy said, I know, but it's the least I could do for her. We had been married for over 38 years. Hey, you like that, Casey? That's for you, buddy. There you go. All right. <laughs> we love golf right here, as you can tell. No, you can't just tease. I can't play golf to save my life. So if you see, the world is going crazy. So what is the answer? Here's the answer. Jesus is coming back soon to make things right. Amen? That's the truth. That is what gives us peace in an insane world, is that Jesus is coming back soon, and he's going to make things right. He's going to turn it from evil being called good to, and good be called evil. He's going to switch it to where good is good and evil is evil again. How many long for that? Amen? The world doesn't understand this. The world doesn't get it, but we do, and Paul tells us in this text of Ephesians that he, the Lord, has made known to us the big picture, or the mystery of his plan. Verse 9 again. The mystery of his will is now being made known or revealed to us. And what is this mystery? Now listen to the very practical ramifications that this has for you and me today. Hear this, verse 9. The mystery of his will is that in due time, middle of verse 10, that he, Jesus, will bring everything together under the authority, or God, I should say, under the authority of Christ. Hear that. That God will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And where everything, that is where everything is going, guys. This is the flow of what is happening in our culture, around the world, at this time in our history. Everything is going to a certain direction, or a certain flow, or a plan of God. But hear this, the world, non-Christians, just don't see it. They just scratch their heads and they, they ask why, they don't, they don't understand why. They get depressed because they have no real hope for a better world. But hear this, if you're in Christ today, you and I as true believers have been blessed today to see the big picture, to see the mystery of His will, Amen. And everything is flowing, and it's all heading for a moment in time in which things are gathered together, things in heaven and things on earth. And everything will be gathered in Christ and around Christ. It's all going according to, hear this, his schedule. Notice it's not going according to his perfect will, right? It isn't perfect will for sin to abound in this world. But guess what? How many here love God? You like God, love God? How many of you here are given to him? given to his purposes. Well, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good. Notice it didn't say all things are good, but all things work together for good to what? To those who love God and are called, or what it means, given to his purposes. If you love God and are given his purposes, even if you're going through a hard time, a hard thing, even if this world is wronging you, guess what? God's going to turn it around for good. Amen. As long as you stay with him. Amen. And so everything is going towards him. Everything is going. Now we think everything is going away from him, but guess what? Everything is going to him. It's going to him. But as I said, the world doesn't get it because it's not in Christ, so it's perplexed. It's anxious. It's depressed. But you and I have a hope because we know, because we understand the still, we understand the mystery that they don't understand. The Lord is coming back soon. Verse 10. He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. When Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom on earth, when we and we will rule and reign with him here on earth, and he will make, hear this, the crazy things of this world right once and for all. How many are excited about that? I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the Lord coming back. I'm excited about... Right being right and wrong being wrong. I'll never forget, as a, you know, I was raised kind of as a hippie kid where you could do anything. But I'll tell you, I loved when I became a Christian because there was absolute truth. You know what I mean? I was so open-minded, my brains leaked out. I, everything was true. And how many know everything cannot be true? Amen? And all of a sudden, when I became a Christian, I remember all of a sudden going, my goodness, it is so cool 
to have boundaries. It's so cool to know the truth. I didn't see it as hindering me or limiting me. I saw it as freeing me or giving me some guardrails to life. Here's the question. Are you letting Jesus be the glue that holds your life together? Are you letting Jesus be, as I said earlier, the atomic glue in your life? We don't just know that Christ is coming back soon. That's not enough and to make things right. But we also need to know the reason for why we're here. The reason why we are created. To we, we know that we, where we're going. And we also know why we're here. Why are you here? Turn with me if you would. And this is the last place I'll have you turn. It's Colossians, New Testament 2. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Give me a wave when you get there so I know. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For through him, Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Verse 17, he existed before anything else, hear this, and he holds all creation together. As I said, you and I were created by Christ. You and I were created for Christ. And ultimately, we're going to be with Christ. We were made by Christ and for Christ, and you were not, hear this, you were not made for golf. You were not made for motorcycle riding. I have Harley shirts, but I don't have a Harley. You were not made for your vocation or job. Believe it or not, you were not even made for parenting. But you and I, first and foremost, were made for Christ, amen? Amen. We were made for Christ and created to be, hear this, in Christ. And how many know you can be saved and still not be in Christ? Because the Bible means, says, if you abide, Jesus said, if you abide in me, that means to live with, to dwell with, spend time with. You abide in me and my word abides in you. Ask whatever you will in my name, it'll be given to you. But he says what? Every branch that does not bear fruit will be what? Cut off and thrown in the fire. Now, a lot of you argue with me what that means, but I think it's pretty obvious you read what it means. It means that, hear this, people say, so are you a Calvinist or a Minus? Here's what I believe for the security of the believer. I believe in the security of the believer of the believer who what? Is continually abiding. Amen? If you're saying, I'm, a, I'm saved, but you're not continually abiding and obeying, then I need to question, because Jesus said what? You will know them by their what? fruits, not by their profession, not by, by their prayer they prayed. You'll know them because why? I love what Spurgeon said. You can't have Christ truly in your heart without him changing it. Amen. That's how you know you're changed. You're going to want, not that you'll be perfect, but you're going to want to obey today more than you did yesterday. Amen. You and I were first made for Christ and we were created, as I said, to be in Christ. Now track with me on this next verse, Colossians 1.17. He existed before everything else began, and he holds, hear this, all creation, or the NIV says, all things together. He holds all things together. The statement here that he holds all things together, this is an amazing statement, amen? For God to make, that, 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 he made, that, that all things are made by him, all things are made for him, and now he says all things are held together by him. Amen. That's pretty cool. How many like that? Jesus is holding everything together. Now you might be saying, okay, Pastor Craig, that's great, but what do you mean by that? Here it is. I'm glad you asked. Here it is. Scientists, now listen carefully. This is where you have to put on your thinking caps, Okay. Because I had to study this, and I don't really understand it completely, but I do, but I don't. I hear this. Scientists are baffled, even to this day. They're baffled by the basic building block of all matter, the atom. Amen? The atom. They say it's a mystery. For you see, around the nucleus of the atom, you have 
electrons spinning. You've seen the pictures of them spinning, the new electrons spinning. And the nucleus of the atom is charged with positively charged particles called protons, right? And those are the things spinning around, the nucleus of the atom, along with neutrons, and, and, the neutral, and they are neutral. And here where the, here's where the mystery is. The law of, I think it's Colin's law of electricity, says that very specifically, and you and I prove it all the time, have you ever taken magnets as a kid and you put magnets together? What happens? You put two positive magnets, they what? They repel. You put two negatives, they repel, right? They repel, right? But you put a, a, a negative and a positive together, what? They attract. So here it is. Here's the mystery. In the center of the atom, the nucleus, you have positively charged protons packed together, spinning around. Now hear this. This is what baffles scientists. What's keeping them from repelling against each other or flying apart. And all scientists can do is call it the atomic glue. They don't understand why. Isn't that amazing? We always think that, oh, oh scientists know everything. No, there's mysteries. And they go, you know what? This shouldn't be. This goes against Colin's law of two positives repel. But somehow these positive pro protons are staying together. And guess what? What happens if they don't stay together? A nuclear explosion, right? If we can knock them out of existence, and ping, it's like ping pong balls popping, and that's what happens. How many are glad God doesn't let that happen to you every day? Can you imagine just walking to work, boom, and just everything's flying apart, right? Yeah, exactly. There you go. The scientists today still don't know. They don't know the mystery, the mysterious force that holds the atom together. But guess what? You and I do, don't we? Something that's holding you together, that something is, as Colossians 1.17 says, that, that, that mystery is who? Jesus. Jesus is holding all things together, amen? And if Jesus can hold the atom together, then he can hold your life together. Amen. He can hold your marriage together. He can hold your families together. He can hold the church together. Amen. Amen. Right. There you go. Now, there might be some of you here today that sadly say, but honestly say, Pastor Craig, I'm a Christian, but it doesn't seem like my life is really being held together very well. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. Maybe you have kids that, that were raised in a Christian home but are kind of falling away. Maybe your job's not holding together. Maybe your business. And you go, Craig, I'm a Christian, but my life seems like it's kind of spinning apart. I believe Christ holds all things together. And you would say amen to that, but hear this. You, if you were honest today, you'd say, my life doesn't feel like it's really holding together very well. But hear this, Christian, or even if you're not a Christian today, hear this. Here's the key of how to be held together. The key is that we need to be in Christ. You can be saved and still not be in Christ or not abide in Christ. You know, that's, there's a difference between knowing Christ and abiding in Christ. Amen? Amen? We need to know Him. Some of you go a whole week without reading your Bible until you come on Sunday. Some of you go a whole week without praying and you wonder why your life spins out of control. And yet Jesus said in, in John 15, He says what? If you don't abide in the vine, you will what? You can't bear fruit. How many know we need his strength to live this life? And so, you know, whenever my life seems like it's going crazy, I have to go, oh, I got off the vine. Now, I'm not saying you lost your salvation. Don't hear that. I'm saying you aren't abiding and aren't getting that strength that only God can provide and that strength of God to hold the crazy things of your life together. Let's look at what Jesus did when he felt like all things in his life were falling apart or flying apart, when Judas, one of the twelve, betrayed him, when Pilate falsely sentenced him, when his close friends fell asleep, when he needed them the most on, in the garden, when he said, pray with me, just pray with me, what did Jesus do? He prayed. Amen? I want to tell you guys, I'm learning this, and I'll tell you, prayer is the key to a revival. And I don't mean a revival like, ooh, ooh, I don't mean that. I mean a changed life. I mean a changed church. I mean a changed culture. 
an awakening. I like the word awakening better because revival can just mean an exciting meaning. How many know we need an awakening in our country? We need a turning back to God and not all gods, the one true God of the Bible. And to have that, we need to pray. And I want to tell you, we've been praying on Friday nights. We've been praying a lot. And I'll tell you, God is starting to do a work in us. I, I'll tell you this. No one, as it says in, in Romans, no one can separate you from the love of God. I don't care if you're going through a hard marriage. I don't care if you're going through a struggle with your kids. The only one who can separate you from God is you. And if you're hurting right now, the answer is to turn and be in Christ. And what do we tend to do? We pull away. We go golfing. We do something. We go motorcycle riding. We drink. We whatever. And how many know that makes a bad situation what? Worse. But we need to turn and be in Christ. Here's what Jesus did. Here's what he prayed. Luke 22, 42. You don't have to turn there. Just write it down if you're a note taker. He said, Father, talking about the cross, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup or cross of suffering away from me. Hear Jesus. He's God Almighty come in the flesh. But yet he says, Father, please. Doesn't say, hey, do it. He says, Father, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Notice he brought his humble request to the Father. Please, Father, take this cup of suffering away. Now listen to how he ends his prayer to the Father. He ends it by coming under the authority of the Father's will. He says what? But not my will, but your will be done. I want to tell you this. I get so mad. You know, I, we are a charismatic church, but we want to do things, as the Bible says, decently in order. We don't want to go, ooh, ooh, against the Scripture. Amen? And I want to tell you this, that we need to make sure that we are under the authority of Christ. I heard a pastor once say, a charismatic pastor, hey, you don't have to ask God, say, if it's your will. You just command it. How many know... If Jesus, your Lord and Savior, and my Lord and Savior says, Father, if it be your will, how many know we need to say that? We need to make our requests, right? We need to make our requests, but we need to always preface it with, not my will, but your will be done. If your life, as I said, feels like it's falling apart, if it's spinning out of control, I challenge you to cry out just like Jesus that your life and your family would be under the authority of Christ. And how many know there's a lot of people who profess the name of Christ who are not under his authority? Amen? I mean, I could tell you story after story of people proving that. You remember what Jesus said? If you love me, you obey my commandments. Jesus also said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? I love what Henry Blackaby said. He said it so well. He says people say, oh, it's just so hard to obey the Lord. And he said it's not an obedience issue. It's really a love issue. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey. That's why we spend so much time in worship. Because we believe that if you get a taste of his love for you and you can just worship in love, respond in love, that you'll be touched. How many get touched in worship to where you go, oh, Lord, I want to surrender more? How many, Amen. And that's why we do it. It's not just for the cute songs and the guitar licks. It's for you to be in the presence of God because in his presence there's fullness of joy. In his presence he can get past all those walls you have and say, hey, give your life to me. Ephesians 1.10 again says this, and this is his plan. At the right time he'll bring everything, that's you and I, together under the authority of Christ. And when you and I willingly come under the authority of Christ, then our lives will be held together securely, just like the Adam. Amen? But hear this. Here's the sad warning. But if we don't come under the authority of Christ, then we, just like the world, will see our lives flying apart. Sadly, just like the world, just like a nuclear explosion, just flying apart. And how many know, I am tired of seeing Christian families fly apart. Amen? Amen. Divorce is just as high in the church. People argue, oh no it isn't. Yes, it is. 
And why? Because I believe two things. We're not in Christ a lot of times. We just saved, but we do our own thing. We're not in Christ, and we're not what? Under the authority of Christ. Because when you're under the authority of Christ, your life is going to change. Amen? Amen. You're not going to just be a hearer of the Word, but as James said, you're going to be an effectual doer. You're going to say, Lord, let this be so in my life. And you're going to want the truth lived out. So today I want to encourage you to submit your life completely to the authority of Christ. Amen? Amen. So that you'll be held together. Your family will be held together. Your marriage will be held together. Your children. How many want your children held together in this crazy world? How many know you're setting the standard? If you're not submitted to Christ, why would they submit to Christ? Amen? Amen? If you want, you know, an attitude, as I've said, is easier caught than taught. You want your kids to submit to the will of the Father, then they need to see you submit to the will. They need to see you do the right thing even when it hurts, just like Jesus. And when they see that, then guess what? They're going to say, you know what, if my dad and mom do it, then I can do it. I want to see everyone in this church and a lot of Christians around the world, I want to see us safely get to heaven in the midst of a world that is spinning crazily out of control. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? With every head bowed and every eye closed out of respect for the Lord, I want to ask you today, humbly, that maybe you're here today and Maybe the Lord has convicted you and spoken to your heart. And maybe He's shown you that you are maybe saved, but you really aren't in Christ. You haven't really been living and dwelling with Him like you know you should. Or even probably second, even greater yet, maybe you've known Christ and you say, I love Christ, but you haven't really been submitting to Him. You really haven't been coming under his authority. The Bible says this, hear this. It says, submit therefore to God. Come under his authority. That's what it means. Submit there, come under his authority. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he what? Must flee. If it feels like the devil has been in your home and attacked your home, then the way to chase him out is what? Come under the authority of Christ. If you're here today and the Holy Spirit is convicting you of some area of your life that you have not surrendered Or maybe you just kind of been doing your own thing in His name and today the Holy Spirit is saying, submit to me, church. Submit to me, Father. Submit to me, Son. Submit to me, daughter. Submit to me, wife. That you might have the power of my Spirit holding you together. Keeping you secure. Your marriage secure. Your family secure. Your job secure. And you can leave this place knowing that Romans 8, 28 won't just be a promise, but it'll be lived out in your life that he will work all things together for good to those who love him and are called or given to his purposes, submitted to his purposes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that is you today and you'd say humbly, Pastor Craig, that's me. I'd like to pray that prayer. Would you pray for me that I might be in Christ and I might submit to him? With every head bowed and every closed, if that is you, just raise your hand humbly before God right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you back there. God bless you right there and right here. God bless you right in the front. Anyone else who didn't raise their hand, just raise your hand to the Lord if you need prayer. Amen. God bless you right there. I want to pray for you right now. And those, how many know all of us need to pray this prayer? Amen. Even if you think, well, I'm good. How many know there's always areas you can submit to God? There's always, I could always abide more in the Lord. So I want to pray for you right now. Would you just pray with me? Lord Jesus, I ask that right now you would just fill your people with your Holy Spirit. Father, you will not violate our will, but I ask that, Lord, you, it says in your word that you work in us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. And I ask that you would work this work in us. You would give us a desire to be in you, to dwell with you, to abide in you. 
And you'd also give us the desire to submit to you, to come under your authority, to realize that everything is going to bow, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, your word says, to the glory of the Father. But Lord, we want to bow now, amen? Amen. We want to bow willingly. We don't want to be forced to bow. We want to bow because we love you. Because we know you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so, Lord, out of love, we submit our lives to you right now. Lord, out of love, we submit our marriages to you right now. Lord, out of love, we submit our children to you right now. Out of love, we submit this church to you right now and others like it. And Lord, we submit this country to you, Lord. That we'd come back to you, that as our coins say, as our dollar bills say, in God we trust, that we would trust once again in you as a country. Lord, we want to come under the authority of Christ. So, Father, bless your people. Let us realize, as you said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from you, Lord, our lives will fall apart. When we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption, just like the world. We will reap death. Maybe not eternal death, but we will reap death. We will reap the consequence of sin. But when we walk by the Spirit, when we sow to the Spirit, we'll reap what? Everlasting life. We'll reap life. And life more abundantly. And I know everyone in their right mind here wants life. Amen? Wants life for their marriage. Wants life for their family. Wants life for this church. Wants life for America. Wants blessing. And Lord, we humbly come under your authority realizing that every good gift comes from you, Lord, and you alone. Bless your people, Lord. Let this prayer be true in our lives. May we be in Christ this week and from this week on until we meet you face to face. And may we be submitted to the authority of Christ, coming under the authority of Christ willingly in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you. And uh, why don't we stand? Can we sing that surrender again? I surrender.